Good morning, everybody. I'm Ralph Delarada. I'm privileged to be the uh, chair of the uh, capital campaign for the City Club and uh, also um, managing partner of Western Reserve Partners here in Cleveland, an investment banking firm. Uh, today is really a historic day um, within a very historic framework. Uh, I've been very proud to be a past president of the City Club and uh, this year, in uh, October of 2012, we'll celebrate our centennial. And um, it's a very momentous occasion. We're delighted to kick off this new business series. Um, and this was an idea that came about some years ago. And the reason for this series um, is there are so many topics, business topics and current topics that need to be uh, explored and we need to have thought leaders from all over the country, even all over the world, to come to Cleveland to um, inform us, better inform us as to what's going on. But also it provides a nice community um, activity and uh, nexus for people to get together downtown. For many of us who work downtown or even in the suburbs, uh, it's great to have a program like this. So that is the genesis of it. It came about three years ago when I was chair of the program committee and I said to Jim Foster, our director of the City Club, that it would be fortuitous if we could engage the business community more deeply into what the City Club is doing and also um, provide uh, another learning experience. Uh, we couldn't have done this uh, without um, uh, Dan Walsh and Huntington Bank, who have been really a leader in revitalizing downtown and doing so much for our community. Uh, Dan is uh, just doing a terrific job as uh, his whole staff and also Lute Harmon and his folks. We really truly appreciate all that you're doing and this partnership that we have uh, will be very important we think for years to come. So today's a momentous occasion and we're very happy to have you here with us in our inaugural uh, business series. I'm going to ask Dan Walsh to step up now. Dan is uh, the president of Huntington Bank here in Cleveland. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to welcome all of you to the, the Business Leader Series here this morning. As Ralph mentioned, a lot of effort has gone into really designing a curriculum that we think will um, be fresh and new that will help propel us going forward. Um, we're, we're really proud to partner with Inside Business and the City Club to lead in this meaningful dialogue around how we as a region will be instrumental in leading the United States in the economic recovery. It's a historic moment. Um, but we designed this series differently. Um, as uh, Ralph mentioned, you know, that there's been in, in a lot of work for the last couple of years, but really last summer we began working with the City Club and Inside Business closely to create a series of discussions with business leaders that builds on the growing momentum in our region. And we gave the series the appropriate flexibility to draw on the lessons that history has presented to us, but to really build the conversation, steer our region's future as it unfolds in the upcoming months and, uh, and uh, upcoming years. Wayne Gretzky famously said that a great hockey player, or a good hockey player, plays where the puck is. A great hockey player skates to where the puck is going to be, and that's what the series is about. It's a can't-miss series that is a vehicle to lead our, our region from good to great, and we will introduce timely topics worthy of broad civic dialogue, inspiring action in our region. In a few moments, Federal Reserve President and CEO Sandy Pianalto will kick off the series and set the stage for Cleveland Fed's regional economic outlook. The programs that follow today's dialogue will include how to lever Ohio's role as a swing state, the redefining of manufacturing, and how regional talent attraction and retention will increase our global competitiveness, amongst other timely topics. A few weeks ago, County Executive Fitzgerald unveiled his Western Reserve Plan in the second state of the county address. And at the crux of his remarks was what I refer to as an inside-out strategy, where we capitalize on the city's world-class institutions and new development. When we strengthen our city's core, the surrounding municipalities grow stronger. To think about things more broadly, if we can continue to connect the dots beyond Cleveland and its suburbs and into Youngstown, Akron, Canton, we solidify our, our competitive, competitiveness on a global scale. The pillars have been set. Downtown Cleveland is in the midst of perhaps the greatest renaissance in our city's history. Cranes decorate the skyline. Growing businesses are snatching up Class A office space. Economic drivers like the Medical Mart and the Convention Center and flats projects are underway. In a few months, the casino will open on Public Square, and the core of the largest city in our region is getting stronger, and this momentum will benefit everyone. 
throughout Northeast Ohio, the harvesting of natural resources is spurring economic growth. And the demands of the energy boom are already spurring growth at manufacturing companies throughout the region who produce steel, electronics, and raw materials needed to revitalize the, uh, to capitalize on this opportunity. It, is also, it also has the potential of reinvigorating our port, our airport hub, our rail systems, and infrastructure in a manner that hasn't been seen in generations. This is an exciting time for our region. The pillars have been set, and it's up to us to build on that foundation to drive additional economic development and growth, and I'm glad you're all here to join us on this mission. I now have the great honor of introducing our the true leader in our region, Sandy Pianalto. Sandy is the 10th Chief Executive of the 4th District Federal Reserve Bank at Cleveland. She earned a bachelor's degree in economics at the University of Akron and a master's in economics at George Washington University. She is a graduate of the Advanced Management Program at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business, and Sandy is, an incredible, is incredibly active in our community. She serves on the boards of a number of community organizations, including the Cleveland Foundation, Greater Cleveland Partnership, College Now, University Hospitals, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce Sandy Pianalto. Thank you, Dan, for that uh, very nice introduction. And good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, when um, actually Ralph called me to invite me to be the inaugural speaker uh, of this new business leaders series, I was uh, very eager to accept uh, the invitation. Uh, as Ralph mentioned, the City Club is celebrating its 100th anniversary in October, and it's uh, it's celebrating and reaching that milestone for a reason, and that is that uh, this is one of the city's gems. And I congratulate the City Club on its upcoming 100th anniversary and your legacy of speakers. And um, th that legacy is unprecedented in the United States. So it's a privilege for me to be here uh, on this platform in any capacity. And actually, I'm returning to this platform. I've been privileged to uh, be a speaker here uh, uh, twice uh, before. So it is a privilege for me to, to be here today and, and to be the inaugural speaker of what I think is going to be a, an exciting <coughs> exciting series, and a timely one, as Dan pointed out. The underlying theme of this series uh, is about driving growth in the region and uh, in the global economy. And these are topics that I think about a lot in my role as president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Here in Northeast Ohio, and I've been uh, here for many, many, many years. I've been at the Cleveland Fed for 28 years, so yeah. I'm pretty much a, a local person. And, and so I've been thinking about our region for, for a long time. And it's clear that here in Northeast Ohio, we have to constantly upgrade our businesses and communities to energize and to sustain economic growth. So with that in mind, this morning I'm going to cover three topics. I'm going to describe economic conditions in the region, and then I'm going to explain that the keys to our region's growth are education and innovation. And then finally, I'll close with some comments about the steps that the Federal Reserve is taking to support the nation's economic recovery. So let me start with economic conditions in the region. Here in Northeast Ohio, we've actually weathered the Great Recession better than many other parts of the country. The unemployment rate here in Northeast Ohio stood at 7.4%, uh, which is the most recent reading, which was in December of 2011. And this is nearly a, a point lower than the national rate, which was 8.5% at that time. And this is a striking contrast to this region's recoveries from past recessions. For example, during the harsh recession of the early 1980s, unemployment in Ohio peaked near 14%, which was three percentage points above the national rate at that time, and it remained there for several years. Conditions in Northeast Ohio were even worse than, than the state conditions. Ohio lost almost a half a million jobs in that recession, that was more than 10% of our total employment. And Ohio's job loss accounted for about 20% of the job loss nationally. This high unemployment rate that, we, uh, that 
very dismal employment situation that we experienced was in part due to the fact that our region had a greater share of employment in manufacturing. And, manu and, and manufacturing was really hit very hard during that recession. Today, the impact of manufacturing on our local economy is very different, and in our national economy, it's very, very different. Manufacturing hasn't been the lead weight uh, pulling down our economy. In fact, I've been hearing many stories about the strength and resurgence in manufacturing. So I was pleased to hear Dan's comment that one of our speakers uh, following uh, in this series is going to be talking about the resurgence in manufacturing. In 2011, manufacturing employment increased more than 3.5% here in Northeast Ohio and about 2% nationally. So these statistics do demonstrate that uh, our region is much more diversified as an economy, and that's uh, very good news. We're also seeing relatively better news in Northeast Ohio in terms of incomes. Now, income measures uh, the salaries that we earn, the investments, the earnings on our investments, business profits, and transfer payments. And a region's income reflects what households have available to spend. The level of a region's per capita income also tells us a lot about the standard of living in a region. And the growth rate of per capita income gives us a sense about how economic conditions are changing over time. In 2010, which is again the last year that the data is available, average per capita income in Northeast Ohio rose 3%. And that's, again, slightly outpacing the national average. And it's also 3% uh, growth after two years of decline. To put this in context, a 3% increase in income translates into about $3 billion available to spend in the local economy. Now, although this uh, recent good performance uh, in incomes is encouraging, we have to keep in mind that income growth in this region has been persistently lower uh, than the national average for the past several decades. And uh, that pattern is evident uh, at the state level as well. Uh, Fifty years ago, Ohio's per capita income was much higher than the national average. But today, it's fallen to just average among the 50 states. So what can we do to Im improve our income growth in the region? Well, economists in my, dang, in my bank researched the factors that make states more prosperous. And they did a study that looked at a very long period of time, a 75-year period of time, from 1929 to 2004. And the results of their research are clear. Over that entire period of time, 75 years, there were two factors that always rose to the top of factors that are key to driving income growth. And those two factors are education and innovation. Their re research shows that regions with a more educated workforce and higher rates of innovation saw their incomes grow dramatically faster over longer periods of time. Simply put, States that have more knowledge capital perform better than states with less. Now, these states with more knowledge capital have a larger pool of highly skilled workers that generate new ideas and find new ways of doing business. And these workers are also tend to, may also be more flexible in adopting new technologies. So if education and innovation are the key drivers of growth, then let's look at how our region stacks up in, in terms of those two drivers. Let's start with education. The percentage of population with a college degree serves as a good measure for education, uh, since today so many of the jobs require more than just a high school degree. And based on this metric, and I, I know many of you in this room know this um, already, based on this me metric, Ohio doesn't stack up very well. Uh, we rank 38th out of the 50 states, uh, and we have been in the lower part of that distribution for many decades. However, um, the statistic may be slightly misleading. 
because Ohio has a, a relatively older population. And people who are 55 years and older generally are, not, are less likely to have a college degree in any part of the country. So our researchers dug a little deeper and they focused on a younger age group, uh, those people between the ages of 25 and 34. And in this age group, Ohio does a little better. Uh, we're in the middle of the pack of the younger, uh, for younger residents with a college degree. We rank 25, 25th out of the 50 states. And if we look even deeper and look at postgraduate education of 25 to 34 year olds, Ohio does even better, ranking 17th out of the 50 states. Now this isn't ideal, but it's uh, a clearly movement in the right direction. Now while these statistics are for Ohio as a whole, we find that, that this, the trends here in Northeast Ohio are, are very consistent with, the, with what's happening in, in the entire state. Our overall, and, that, and the, the message is that our overall educational attainment levels lag the nations considerably, but our younger residents seem to be doing better. In addition, we need to remember that the comparisons that I'm making are all within the United States, but we all know so well that our workers and our companies are increasingly competing at a global level. Uh, and our performance in the United States relative to the rest of the world is, is not a great story either. Uh, back in 1995, the United States had the second highest college graduation rate in the world, but by 20, uh, 2008, we slipped to, to 13th. Um, so we went from the second highest graduation rate to 13th. In a recent comparison of the 34 developed countries on performance and test scores in, from high school students, the United States ranked 14th in reading, we ranked 17th in science and 25th in math out of the 40, 34 developed states. Now it's not so much that the United States is falling back, but it's that other countries like Finland and South Korea that are improving their educational outcomes. So clearly the message is that in order for us to remain competitive, uh, the U.S. labor force has to become even better educated and better skilled. So that's the story on education. But beyond education, as I mentioned, our research also shows that innovative regions experience higher growth. Innovation begins with new ideas, but for those ideas to have an economic impact, they have to be commercialized. And in our bank's research, the economists used U.S. patent data to measure innovation because patents are a critical step uh, in moving ideas, uh, and in this case, inventions, into profitable business ventures. Without moving ideas all the way into this commercialization process, there's no extra income that gets generated in our community. Historically, Ohio has been a relatively innovative state, but again, over time, that advantage has diminished. At one time, Ohio ranked sixth in the nation in the number of patents per capita. But today, again, Ohio has fallen to the middle of the pack. How did this happen? Well, Ohio has increased our patent activity, but we're just not keeping pace with the rest of the country. For example, the number of newly issued patents in Ohio in 2010 was just up 1% from 20, uh, the year 2000. In contrast, over that same period of time, the number of new patents issued nationally was up 27%. So what can our region do to foster innovation? Unfortunately, the research on how to generate innovation as a region is not as well developed as educational attainment. We do know, first and foremost, that a region needs to be able to produce new ideas and research, play, and research institutions play an important role in this process. And uh, we have two leaders of uh, two important research institutions here in, in Northeast Ohio, uh, Lester Lefton, who's the uh, president of Kent State University, 
a university that's doing a good research, and um, Tom Zenti, who's the CEO of University Hospitals, another research important research institution in our region. So those institutions do play a critical role. But nonetheless, it, what's interesting is the innovation that results in patents are primarily generated by companies, private sector companies. In fact, in the Cleveland area, between 2006 and 2010, almost 90% of the newly issued patents were connected with companies. Government initiatives can also play an important supporting role in fostering innovation. The state of Ohio has made significant investments to support research and commercialization through the Third Frontier Program. And here in Northeast Ohio, Jumpstart is the regional partner for the Third Frontier's Entrepreneurial Investment Program. And this organization has a, a growing portfolio of new businesses in the Northeast Ohio that are developing new products and new ideas and generating incomes that are important to our region. These endeavors, along with other local initiatives such as bioenterprises and Nortech, have brought a, renew, a renewed focus uh, supporting innovation in our region. And that focus is obviously uh, uh, benefiting economic growth throughout the region. So as we pr pursue these efforts uh, to improve the prosperity of the region, you know, I am encouraged that I see as a region we're coming together and we're, are, are, we're coalescing around an agenda that is focused on educational attainment and innovation. These drivers of growth are clearly uh, closely linked Innovative environments typically have strong educational institutions uh, and, and research, research organizations. And they, innovative environments attract a large concentration of people with high human capital. Now ultimately, if we're going to continue to make progress on education and innovation, it can't just be slogans and advertising and quick, fix, uh, quick fixes. You know, we're going to need to work together cohesively, and we're going to need to understand that we're involved in a marathon, uh, not a sprint. It took us a long time to get where we are today, so it's going to take us a long time and a, and, and a focused effort, a concentrated effort, uh, to, to see the improvement and the results that we need. So uh, let me now turn to some comments on how the Federal Reserve is working to support economic growth across the country. Monetary policy it has an important role to play as our economy recovers from the deepest recession that we've had in 70 years. The Federal Reserve's monetary policy making is a group is called the Federal Open Market Committee, or the FOMC. We've been getting a lot of attention and headlines in recent years. And um, this year, I'm a voting member of that committee. I rotate my vote every other year. The committee generally meets eight times a year in Washington, D.C., and we review economic and financial developments, and then we determine the appropriate stance for monetary policy. The committee, the Federal Open Market Committee, is focused on achieving a dual, when we get together, I mean, people ask me, you know, what do you focus on? Well, we, we've been given two mandates by Congress, and that, that's where our focus is. And those two mandates are stable prices and maximum employment. Needless to say, uh, the past few years have been very challenging for monetary policymakers. As you're painfully aware, the economy has been through its worst <coughs> recession since the Great Depression in the 1930s, and we've responded very aggressively and creatively uh, to the economic and financial crisis. In September of 2007, we began to ease monetary conditions, and we do that by lowering what we call the federal funds rate. Now, that's an interest rate that banks charge each other uh, for a loan, very short-term loan, usually overnight. Uh, you and I can't borrow from that federal funds rate. Uh, but the rates that we pay, we as consumers and businesses uh, for loans, do respond to changes in the federal funds rate. By, so in 2007, we started to bring that rate down. Uh, by the end of 2008, we re reduced the federal funds rate to nearly zero. 
and it's remained there ever since. Once that rate fell to zero, we had to employ some different tools to ease monetary conditions further. Uh, think of it as taking the back roads when the highways are shut down. Uh, you know, that route can still get you uh, to where you need to go, uh, but it just may take a little longer and be a little less efficient. These new techniques uh, that we used include the purchasing of large quantities of U.S. Treasury securities and uh, federally guaranteed mortgage-backed securities. Our balance sheet grew from $900 billion prior to the, con to the crisis to nearly $3 trillion today. Our objective in taking these alternative routes is to push down medium and long-term interest rates for consumers and businesses, and we've been successful at doing that. Now, even though we've introduced some new techniques, uh, we're still operating to achieve that dual mandate of stable prices and maximum employment. Now, since we have been taking these unusual steps to conduct monetary policy, we've also uh, stepped up our communications and we've looked at new ways to be transparent, to help the public understand what we're doing and why. And in that spirit, we took an important historic step following our last meeting of the FOMC a few weeks ago. And we released a document titled the FOMC's Longer Run Goals and Policy Strategy. In that statement, we announced for the first time a numerical objective for inflation. Specifically, we stated that inflation, an inflation rate of 2% is the rate most consistent over the long term with the committee's congressional mandate of stable prices. And since inflation over the long run is primarily a monetary phenomena, the responsibility of the Federal Reserve, the committee has the ability to set that target and we can be held accountable for achieving it. Our historic document that we released also addresses how we plan to achieve the other half of our dual mandate, maximum employment. The maximum employment level for the economy, though, changes over time. Uh, it can shift along with uh, a host of non-monetary factors, such as technology changes or demographic changes or regulations. So unlike an inflation goal, central banks can't just pick uh, any level for maximum employment that they desire and achieve it. However, we can estimate what we think the maximum employment is for current economic circumstances, and then we can set policy to achieve it over time. Uh, so in our statement, we also indicated that a majority of the members of the committee, the uh, Federal Market Committee, currently estimate that the U.S. economy can attain an unemployment rate between 5.2 and 6 percent over the longer term. So that's what the committee currently, given our current economic circumstances, that's what the committee thinks would be maximum employment in the economy. So now I've explained our dual objectives. Let me talk for a minute on how I see the economy performing over the next few years. My outlook is that our national economy will continue to gradually improve. I'm expecting the economic recovery to remain moderate and for the economy to grow about 2.5% this year and 3% next year. Our national unemployment rate at 8.3% is still well above the committee, what the committee judges to be consistent with maximum employment. But recent labor market information has been promising. Employment gains have picked up for the past several months. New claims for unemployment insurance have trended down uh, for the past few months. So if the economy grows at the rate that I'm forecasting, this moderate rate that I'm anticipating, it could take as long as four or five years to achieve maximum employment. Those of you who follow the economic data know that inflation was about 3% last year, but, had, but when you look at it over a longer period of time, over a three-year period, it's, it's been at about 1.5%. And, 
And my forecast for inflation is that it'll run close to 2% for the next few years. Still, uh, it's always complicated. Um, the recent spike in oil price, prices and the increase in housing rents could complicate the inflation picture if these persist. My outlook uh, is important in how I think about monetary policy because monetary policy has an impact in the economy with a lag. So we base our policy on our outlook for the economy, not what's happening today, but our outlook. And at our last meeting in January, the committee decided that economic conditions are likely to warrant that we keep short-term interest rates at exceptionally low levels at least through 2014. Now, I want to be clear, uh, however, that this, is a state, that this statement is by no means a commitment that, will not, that we will not raise interest rates until late 2014. Rather, it's an expression of what the committee judges to be the earliest time that we would likely raise interest rates based on our current economic outlook. Changes in the outlook could result in interest rates rising either sooner or later than 2014. And believe me, I would prefer nothing more than to support an interest rate increase before late 2014 if it's on the basis of higher economic growth. But I'm not there yet. I'm comfortable with the current stance of monetary policy. Policy is, in fact, already quite accommodative, both in terms of interest rates and our large balance sheet. With my current outlook, I think the path of interest rates is the one that's best suited to foster steady gains in employment, in output, and to maintain stable prices. In my assessment, doing more at this time could create too much inflation risk, and doing less uh, could risk weakening an already slow expansion and cause an unwelcome disinflation. Of course, I'm going to continue to update my economic outlook as circumstances warrant, and my position on future policy actions will evolve accordingly. So, I mean, I, we are, as I'm sure all of you in this room understand, in a very challenging environment, both nationally and right here in, in our region in Northeast Ohio. You know, whether you run a business, manage a family, or work for a nonprofit organization, you know, we're all going through some of the most difficult and extraordinary challenges we've faced in our lifetime. Fortunately, while some uncertainty remains, I think the national economy is improving. And locally, I think we can take some comfort in the knowledge that we're re performing better in this recovery than we have in past cycles. But of course, um, and I know all of us know this, we can't sit back and relax. We still have much work to do. Specifically, in this region, we need to boost educational attainment and we need to focus on innovation in order to make our region more prosperous. So thank you again for the kind invitation to be your inaugural speaker at this important, exciting series. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sandy, for those remarks. Today at the uh, City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to a Business Leaders Series program featuring Sandy Pianalto, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. We'll return to Sandy and our speaker in a moment uh, for the traditional City Club questions. Please uh, formulate your questions for our speaker now, and remember that questions should be brief and to the point. Holding the microphones today is City Club Program Director Carrie Miller and Special Initiatives Coordinator Phil Williams. We remind you that members and guests alike are welcome to attend City Club forums and hope everyone listening will join the City Club. We'd love to have you as members. This year, as I mentioned earlier, 2012, the City Club of Cleveland turns 100 years old, and there are several programs commemorating this centennial anniversary. Please visit the City Club 100th anniversary website at www.cityclub.org forward slash 100 for more information. Upcoming Business Leaders Series events will include programs on Has it done Ohio any good to be a swing state? Regionalism and the importance of working together. Redefining manufacturing. A global perspective 
of Northeast Ohio and attracting talent and a regional assessment of our strengths and weaknesses. The Business Leader Series is a partnership between the City Club of Cleveland and Inside Business Magazine and is brought to you today by the generous support of Huntington Bank. We'd also like to thank Mead and Moore, Humana, Kent State University, and Oswald Companies for their continuing commitment to and support of this important series. Joining us today at the head table is Dan Walsh of Huntington Bank, Jim Karoulis of Mead and Moore, Frank Armstrong of Humana, Dr. Lester Lefton of Kent State University, and Joseph Dubois of Oswald. Would our sponsors please stand and be recognized. Thank you. Without your support, this wouldn't be possible. Next Thursday, March 8th, the City Club hosts the Honorable Frank G. Jackson, Mayor of the uh, City of Cleveland, for the State of the City Address. For more information about our upcoming forums, please refer to our website, www.cityclub.org. If you wish to make reservations for upcoming programs, order a CD or DVD of today's program, please call 1-888-223-6786 or 216-621-0082. We welcome guests today at tables hosted by Bumpedi and Guests, Charter One, the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, and Medical Mutual. Thank you very much for your support. Now uh, we'd like to return to our Sandy Pianalto for our traditional City Club questions and our answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. First question, please. Sandy, thank you for your insights about the good news and the not so good news about our region. Um, I'd like to turn, however, to talk a little bit about regulation of financial institutions. And whereas I'm not even going to pretend like I understand the regulations, I'd like to talk or, um, more philosophically. So several years ago, leaders of financial institutions lobbied aggressively to um, avoid any further regulations. And then, as we know, the financial institutions got into some trouble, they requested and they received a bailout. So now many of those institutions I believe have recovered um, and now they're moving back into a mode I understand of aggressively lobbying once again for no further regulation. So I'd like to know your thoughts in terms of what regulations might look like or should look like in the future in terms of more or less or different. Barbara, that's a surprising question coming from you. I can tell you're in a new role. Because <laughs> your questions would typically be about empowering women. Uh, but uh, I, I acknowledge that you're in a new role. Um, and uh, regulation is, uh, regulatory policy is an important policy uh, for our, our country. Just as I talked about monetary policy, we have fiscal policy, and obviously regulatory policies are important in terms of longer term growth for our country. Country. And uh, the policies that you were talking about, regulation, regulatory policies around financial institutions um, have been evolving. As you mentioned, prior to the financial crisis, uh, the administration was ready to put out um, proposals for how to further deregulate financial institutions. And obviously the financial crisis um, changed that, as you point out. And um, what we, uh, what Congress passed last year was Dodd-Frank reg regulation. It's a, it's a sweeping financial reform focused primarily on large financial institutions. And what's, and what's, in, what's a, a change is that it's not just focused on large banking organizations, but it's also focused on large financial institutions that are systemically important. And there's been a committee set up that includes the chairman of the Fed, the chairman of the FDC, the, chair, the uh, chair, head of the OCC, the SEC, and some other um, regulatory agencies that come together that's called the Financial Stability Committee. And they will designate those financial institutions that are considered systemically important. And then what Dodd-Frank lays out is additional rules and higher standards for these large banking organizations and for these large systemically important financial institutions. The rules, and that legislation was passed last year, there are over 200 rules that need to be written to put that, that, uh, uh, those, uh, those, that legislation into, uh, into play. 
And so what you're talking about is the fact that now the rule writing is underway, and that's where um, the the lobbyists of the financial institutions are trying to are trying to um, influence how the rules get written. And um, so there and there there are some important rules out net right now for comment. And um, some of these uh, rules, the Volcker rule, for example, is out for comment now. Uh, and the numbers, the, and I think um, Ben made a com Ben Bernanke in his testimony yesterday made a comment about you know the, the thousands of comments that are coming in on these rules because they are important. They will be, they will influence how financial institutions evolve in this country. And so we are in that rule writing phase, and that's where the the uh, financial institutions and their lobbyists are trying to influence how the the regulators put together these rules. But um, so uh, it's evolving. Uh, it's taking a, a long time to get these rules written because they are significant. This was sweeping uh, financial reform, and uh, it, it will be some time before all of the rules get written. And many of the rules have um, some, uh, you know, implementation dates that are further out. So it will give financial institutions time to adjust to the new rules. Sandy. <laughs> Good morning, and again, it's always a pleasure to hear you in a brilliant lecture. We're so proud of you. But uh, earlier this year, you mentioned the three kinds of policies, uh, regulatory, fiscal, and monetary. And earlier this year, when Chairman Bernanke was here, he made quite a point that the Fed should worry about monetary policy and the government should stick to fiscal policy. And we're in a year of an election and possible, again, you know, changes at the governmental level. Uh, what is the dynamic between fiscal and monetary policy? How much should they interact in order to achieve some of the goals that you're seeing? And what influence can the Fed put on the monetary policy with our legislators? Thank you, Jenny, for that nice um, comment and, and for your question. Uh, monetary policy, as I said, fiscal, monetary, regulatory policies are all important policies. Uh, monetary, it's, uh, monetary policy in this country and as it has been evolving throughout the world is independent. Uh, it's so important that monetary authorities be independent from fiscal authorities uh, because in situations and in countries where, and in fact, uh, we're going to be celebrating our 100th anniversary in, uh, tw uh, in 2013, the Federal Reserve is. And when the creators of the Federal Reserve um, were debating what kind of central bank to have, there was a, a camp that wanted in Congress that wanted a totally government central bank that would, that would actually report up through the Treasury. And in fact, the first um, set of board members that were created did have this, a seat for the Secretary of Treasury on the Federal Reserve Board. Um, and then there was a group that wanted a totally independent central bank. Uh, that would be run and owned and operated by the commercial banks in the system. What we got was a compromise. We, we have the Board of Governors in Washington that are appointed by the President and go through the Senate uh, confirmation process. And then you have the 12 reserve banks um, out throughout the country. Uh, the, actually, the uh, banks in our district are required to hold stock uh, in, in our bank. Uh, Dan's Bank, Huntington, is a, a shareholder. And uh, they, elect, uh, uh, they elect some of our directors, and, and the Gov Board of Governors appoints uh, three of our directors. And then I am appointed by that Board of Directors. So I am independent of the government process. Our employees are not government employees. Uh, we are a federally chartered corporation. And so those creators, 100, almost 100 years ago, one recognized that it was important for the Federal Reserve to be independent from fiscal policymakers. That wasn't the case of other central banks around the world. Uh, many central banks at that time reported up through the finance ministers, the equivalent of the U.S. Treasury. And over time, central banks have become, uh, have disengaged themselves from fiscal policymakers and have become more independent. And, and as a result, our outcomes have been better. Uh, we have a much improved inflation environment than we had in the 1970s. Um, so these independent central banks are, are very critical, uh, and um, it's important that we remain independent. Another factor that keeps us independent from fiscal policymakers is, I mentioned we conduct monetary policy by um, uh, or, uh, lowering interest rates. We, um, we in order to, uh, to influence interest rates and, and grow 
or shrink our portfolio, we buy U.S. Treasury securities. We are not permitted to provide, from buy those securities directly from the U.S. Treasury. We buy them from private dealers so that there's that link. The private sector has to have confidence in our U.S. Treasury and the U.S. government and buy those securities, and then we buy them from the private um, sector, private dealers. So it is important for us to be independent from fiscal policymakers in order for us to maintain um, stable prices and maximum employment. Having said that, your comment is, what can we do? Our fiscal policy needs to be fixed. Uh, we, all, we all recognize that. Uh, we're on an unsustainable path, and so fiscal policy does need uh, to be changed. It needs to be uh, set on a different course. We can't, just as we want Congress to stay out of um, telling us how to do our jobs, uh, we have to stay out of telling Congress how to do their jobs. But we can comment on how fiscal policy will impact economic growth and, and our, our, our economic outlook. And so we have been consistent in telling Congress that you know, we're on an unsustainable path. Uh, we do need to fix fiscal policy. Oh, you're going to hold it for me. Um, Sandy, thank you again for uh, speaking. I'm Lute Harmon, Jr. I'm with Inside Business Magazine and Cleveland Magazine. And our business is extremely local. We work with a lot of local retailers. And they tell us that the single biggest catalyst that um, impacts spending with their business is the purchase or the sale of a home. Mm -hmm. People fixing up their home to sell or people fixing up their home when they buy it. What is your impression of the local housing industry right now? Well, um, like many of the stories I've been talking about today, today there is a good news, bad news component. Uh, the good news is that uh, we haven't experienced the um, dramatic depreciation in housing prices that many other parts of the country have. But the bad news is that's because we didn't have the appreciation um, in housing prices. And in fact, uh, the foreclosure situation hit our area, our region, um, very hard um, before it even started to, to hit other areas of the country. Um, part of that was because of um, some unusual situations in, in our region. There was not a lot of new home building uh, going on in, in Northeast Ohio as there was in other parts of the country. Um, but there were, uh, many mortgage brokers that came into this area and encouraged a lot of home owners to refinance homes um, in terms that they could not, um, un they did not understand and, and, and then could not uh, keep up with payments. So we had a, a foreclosure issue um, here that hit us hard even though we didn't have that run up appreciation in, in housing prices um, as, as many other parts of the country did. Um, clearly, you know, housing is, remains d depressed. Um, it is a serious drag on economic, our economic recovery. Uh, as you mentioned, um, you know, housing was an important uh, part of individuals' wealth, and almost a third of that got wiped away uh, through this financial crisis. So uh, consumers are struggling to rebuild that wealth um, because they feel less wealthy. Obviously, that's had an impact on consumer spending, and, uh, and, and it has been a drag, as you point out. Again, uh, the fix is here. We're doing our part, back to monetary and fiscal policy. We're doing our part. Uh, we've lowered interest rates that have brought mortgage rates down. In fact, on the mere announcement that we were going to be purchasing large quantities of mortgage-backed securities, mortgage rates fell almost 100 basis points on that mere announcement. And our, and our continual, um, uh, our monetary policy actions have continued to push down interest rates and mortgage rates have come down. That has allowed people to refinance homes. Uh, and as they've refinanced, those, bringing those interest rates down from the 6% or 7% mortgages that they had prior uh, to this recession down to closer to the 4% range has given them a lot of additional income. Uh, some of that income has been used to start to rebuild their balance sheets, uh, to deleverage uh, and, uh, themselves. Some of it, though, has gone into more spending. And that's been the push behind our 
that's been you know, the strategy that we've had in trying to bring interest rates down. But there's also more to do on the fiscal policy side. The, the Federal Reserve issued a white paper that sets out an array of options for how for, to, for Congress to consider on how to um, change some of the housing policy, make some changes to housing policy. We didn't recommend any one action, but we set out a series of options to help, again, uh, from the fiscal side for con that takes congressional action to improve the housing situation. Sandy, again, thank you for an extremely transparent and, and very informative uh, presentation. I'm Von Del Petrie, and I represent um, Lee Hack Harrison, DBM, and that's talent management in our region. My question has to do with education. We all agree that a great deal needs to be done, and you underscored that in your presentation. Just wondering about your perspective in terms of uh, the choices that are in Cleveland. I'm thinking of some of the better charter schools, breakthrough schools, which has done an incredible job of bringing standards up uh, for children that are attending those schools. But what perspective do you have and do you bring about the dilemmas we have in Cleveland regarding education and what to do about that? Thank you. Thank you. That's an excellent question. And, and um, President Lepton and I were talking about this uh, just at breakfast this morning because I mentioned in my comments that educational attainment is so critical uh, for the future of our region it's a, and for the future of our country. Um, and it's not as simple as saying, okay, we need to get, we do need um, more, more people to graduate to, from college because, as I mentioned, we're ranked 38th out of the 50 states. But, um, again, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's going to take us a, a long time to improve those numbers because you really have to start at preschool. Um, the Fed, Federal Reserve, uh, one of my colleagues at the Minneapolis Fed did a study not too long ago, and actually um, a Nobel Prize winner in economics, Jim Heckman, also did a similar study that showed the, um, the greatest return on investment, uh, public investment, is in early childhood development, early preschool, uh, because you, we've got to start um, helping children learn how to learn before they even get into school, learn how to socialize. Um, so that's an important area to start. But as um, President Lefton and I were talking, you know, here in, North, in Ohio, we also have a cultural issue that we need to overcome. Data shows that if both parents went to college, there's a more than 90% chance that the, the children of those parents will go to college. If only one parent, the number falls to 60, and if neither parents, it falls below 30%. And as I said, here in Ohio, we don't have a high level of, of, of college attainment by the adults, so the 55-year-olds and older. And so, um, and so we've got to overcome this cultural uh, barrier. Uh, and that means we've got to help, um, we have to help schools, help children understand um, what, the, um, what going to college and the importance of going to college is all about and get them ready um, uh, early in, in, in their school lives. Uh, as um, President Lefton also pointed out, you know, that some of the students that come to Kent State University don't have the skills to be successful at Kent State as they get there. And so we've got to make sure they're, they're graduating from high school with the appropriate skills. So uh, um, as I'm laying out, it's a broad spectrum. It's not a simple one, let's target one area of ed the educational system. It starts from preschool all the way up through, um, through higher education. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a crisis that we have, not only here in our region, but nationally. And we do need to bring a, a focus to that. As I mentioned, I'm encouraged that we are all beginning to recognize that that's so critical, not only for our region, but for the country. So, you know, they always say you've got to at least acknowledge what your problem is before you can start attacking it. And I think there is some uh, coalescing around uh, that, the acknowledgement that that's got to be a focus. Now we've got to bring resources to that, and, and that's a challenge because, you know, at all levels of government, we're um, being, we're feeling constrained, uh, and, and there aren't a lot of dollars. Uh, so that means we've got to prioritize those dollars, and let's hope that our prioritization of those dollars that are available at the state and local level and the federal level go toward these critical issues. 
Uh, Sandy, hi. Uh, I don't know if this is an appropriate question for the President of the Federal Reserve here, but uh, you've spoken about the economic activity in uh, the region and the growth that's happening in downtown Cleveland, and specifically there's going to be a casino opening up. Is that going to help the economy of our region? Is that bringing new money into this area, or is it just moving money around from one part of the community to another part of the community? What are your thoughts on, on the impact of that effort? Well, Jim, um, you're... Um you're correct, and it's probably not a, a it's not it's not a, a, it's not a specific project that the Federal Reserve has looked at. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, ha you know, having said that, there you know, we we do see some vibrancy that's that's um, occurring in in downtown Cleveland, and and that's helping create jobs, the construction jobs that are being created, and then the jobs that will be created within those facilities. That's all very important to any local economy. Creating jobs is important, but I think we we need to and and, and I would put that um, under the category of some short-term fixes. But we really, we're, if we don't change the fundamentals, if we don't um, create jobs for highly skilled individuals, um, you know, we we look at the areas of the country where you've seen renaissance, but sustained renaissance, whether it's Silicon Valley or the Boston area, or the Golden Triangle. Um, those are all areas where they were able, through the, the combination of technology and, uh, or innovation, and highly educated people. I mean, you know, when, the, when those companies started to, to, um, to grow, it attracted highly skilled people. I know, um, you know I, I'm on the board at University Hospitals, as was mentioned. And, um, and it's exciting to watch the talent that wants to come here to Northeast Ohio um, in, the, in the biosciences and medical sciences and life sciences. And the talent wants to go where there is talent. You want to go, you know, even if, it's, if, if you're, um, and I, this is a very sore subject, if you're a um, sports figure, <laughs> you want to go. You want to go to a winning team, right? So talent wants to come to winning teams, and we're starting to create those winning teams here in, in Northeast Ohio. And now we need to sustain that by making the investments. Um, again, I know I sound like a broken record, but making the investments in education and innovation. You know, Sandy paid the City Club a compliment that we're a gem of the city, but I think we'd all agree that she's truly also a gem of the city. <laughs> Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to a business leader series program featuring Sandy Pianalto, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And I guess we have a lot of work to do, she says, so we'll let everybody get back to work. <laughs> this forum is now adjourned. Thank you.